Shabbat 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 Shalom. Okay. We are going to start. We're live here. And um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. This is Oxygen for the Soul. Um, we are going to try to share some ideas for the uh, Pasha this week. It's the longest Pasha of the year, Pasha Naso, more verses than any of, of the other Parshiot. And um, it begins with, um, you know, uh, God imparting to us the priestly blessings. You know, Hashem Yirecha, Vishmarecha, Yaya Hashem, Vishmarecha, 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 Shalom. God gives um, the Jewish people, the um, gives first to our patriarch Abraham the privilege of giving the blessings, as the pasuk says, bracha, you will be a blessing. That honor then was passed to Isaac and then to Jacob. And in this parasha, God instructs Moshe to give this particular privilege of power and the power of blessing to Aaron and his descendants. Um, now. Outside of uh, these, these particular uh, blessings are recited in the land of Israel every single day. Um, if you're a Kohen, you're saying them every day. If you're Sephardic and you're living in America, you're hearing it whenever the Torah is being uh, every day as well. And um, you know, it's a it's a beautiful uh, custom when fathers and sons are there together, and the Kohanim go up and they give the blessings. Now, regardless of where you may or may not reside. Uh, this, these blessings, uh, these priestly blessings are recited every single day, even if there are no Kohanim recited, um, that which they recite without the blessing itself, without the bracha. Um, uh, we recite them during the morning, uh, we recite them at night in the bedtime Shema. Uh, the uh, Chazan sa says these blessings during the repetition of the Midah as well. If you stop and consider for a moment uh, that these blessings have survived the centuries and are part of of us today as they were recited thousands of years ago when god proclaimed them at sinai you have to kind of like not be moved by the awesomeness of that it's not only during our formal prayers that we pronounce these blessings but on the eve of every shabbat and the uh, glowing um, beautiful candle lights that our mothers light um, you know, prior to, you know, for after making Kiddush for Sephardim, before making Kiddush for Ashkenazim, the, the dads or moms impart this blessing to their children. Right? How awesome is it that parents have the power of blessing their children, that every word that we recite were given to God, from God to man, right? That's what you're doing on Friday night when you're giving that bracha, you're receiving that bracha, you're hearing words, you're using the words that God gave to his people. When we pronounce these blessings, we are connecting with the millions of souls that preceded us. We're there with our grandparents, our great grandparents, and so on and so forth, right? Even those who are no longer with us, they are the ones that whispered those words to their children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. And God willing, you'll be doing the same for your children and your grandchildren and so on and so forth, right? To this day, we can hear the voices of our fathers and our grandparents whose blessings uh, we were privileged to receive. They are forever going to accompany, accompany us wherever we go, from generation to generation. Now, the blessing is composed of three parts. First, it contains the three words in memory of the three patriarchs. The second blessing, five words, which anchors us into the five books of Moses. The third, with seven words, reminds us of the seven heavens, or the seven days of the week. And God asks to shower his bounty upon us. That's the last of the seven blessings. It's all powerful ideas. Now, before giving over these blessings to the Kohanim themselves have to recite a special prayer. The last words of which are the Hava, with love, teaching us that a precondition to imparting blessings is that one's heart has to be overflowing with love. A person may have Torah wisdom, but one who is not likable, someone who does not, you know, does not like someone else, he won't be able to share these treasures with uh, others and the blessings will always remain somewhat incomplete but if you you don't have to be a kohen to give a bracha you don't have to give a to be a kohen to give a blessing the power of blessing the power of brachot is in the main of each one of us the only prerequisite for 
for that blessing is that our hearts overflow with love. Blessings are so much a part of our lives that in the Hebrew, in the holy tongue, we extend the welcome. We say, Baruch Haba, blessed is the one who comes, right? We're, we're, in a, you know, we're constantly using the words bracha in everything that we do. Diyah Baruch, Diyah Baruch, Ruchim Abayim, Ruchim Abayim. We're always finding a way to bless people around us using that word. Now, the first blessing is for health and sustenance. But once attained, those gifts can easily be abused and taken for granted. So we conclude the blessing with may God protect you so that you may be blessed and be aware of that, that you have a special gift of health and sustenance and we should never take those blessings for granted. The second blessing is a request that God illuminate our minds with the holy teachings of his words in the Torah. And we conclude the blessing with May he cause you to find favor in his eyes. And in the eyes of others, right, we are looking to always be reminded that we are meant to act in a way that other people perceive as being beautiful as well. Right? Any person can possess Torah wisdom. But if he or she is not likable, if he or she is not able to share these treasures with other people, that blessing will remain complete. Last, the third blessing is that God took upon him, upon us with compassion to forgive our sins and grant us shalom, grant us peace. In his blessings, the concluding word is shalom, teaching us that without peace, everything else is worthless and pointless. You see this, unfortunately, this last 11 days of you know, violence in Israel uh, is horrible. If you don't have peace, you have nothing. You've got the most sophisticated society, the most amazing medical you know, advancements and scientific breakthroughs. But if you don't have peace, can't enjoy any of those things. Peace is the prerequisite for everything in life. It's true in our own lives. You don't have peace with your family. You can't enjoy the things that you have. It's broken. Okay. In Ein Shalom, Ein Kum, there is nothing. The Jewish people are so aware of the old importance of Shalom that we conclude every single tilat, every prayer ends with a blessing of peace. Every amida, every even the kaddish ends with a prayer for shalom. Now, you know, I'm a very big believer in reminding each of ourselves every single day that we have a unique mission, a unique mission that only we can accomplish. And it opens with the words, "Count the children of Gershon as well." Right now, what does that mean? As well, what does it mean? The children of Gershon had the responsibility of carrying out the curtains. They had the responsibility of carrying out the heavy, heavy objects of the tabernacle. Now, at first glance, you may think that, you know, uh, to be charged with such a menial task as to be uh, labeled a schlepper, a porter, um, you know, is a uh, very bad thing. Therefore, the Torah tells us, no, these guys aren't just the schleppers. Count them as well. First of all, again, I just want to apologize about all the background noise over here. Um, I was like, in the middle of a meeting. I couldn't get to a, a quiet place to do this. So I'm going to move and end this a little bit quicker than I normally do. Um, but um, the idea is count them as well, reminds us that the children of Gershon were just as important as those who had the responsibility of carrying the Holy Ark itself. Everyone's unique mission is unique and our unique challenges are ours and nobody else, but every single person has value to their unique um, mission in this world. So like for me, it may be the rabbi who's talking and who's doing weddings and other things. And for you, it might be something else. It might be the supporter. It might be the uh, person who's helping people, you know, figure out their other problems. There's, I can't say that one job is more important than the next. Often we, we, we um, diminish our own value by saying, oh, well, I do is not that important. You're wrong. That is what we call Yetzer Hara. That is Satan. Everything that you do can be important if you're doing what you're doing for the sake of helping others and building yourself up. If you're just sitting around and loafing and you're leaning on your natural talents and you are not using your strengths for uh, the things that you're meant to be doing with your time, then you're right. Then you're wasting your time. But if you're constantly focused on doing what you need to be doing, you, my friend, are fulfilling your mission and power. And even the lowly things that you do are just as important as the greatest things that the people are doing. Um, 
So the Pasha is the longest. There are 176 uh, Pesukim. Uh, it's the longest because at the end of the Pasha, the offerings that each prince brought to the tabernacle are counted separately. Now, what's very puzzling over here is that even though each of the princes brought exactly the same gift, instead of counting the components of the first contribution and then stating that the other princes each brought the same gifts, the Torah lists each offering individually. Now, this is much very this is very difficult to understand because. The Torah does not believe in redundancies. Every single word, every single letter, every pronoun, every punctuation is carefully measured. The Torah never repeats anything without a deeper purpose. So then what is the unique significance of this repetition, the offering the names of the prince, right? Now, imagine for a moment, what would happen if a group of friends uh, became engaged at exactly the same time? And after the first was married, uh, the uh, the second person, you know, went to the, to the same exact uh, wedding hall, ordered exactly the same menu, the same flowers, the same bridal gown, same mu musicians, and so on and so forth. Now, that eventually would be, uh, you know, this first of all, this event would never happen, right? No, there are no, uh, no, uh, no one wants to do a copy and paste of somebody else's wedding, and the reason for that is because the bride and groom of the first wedding would be resentful of the couple for copying exactly what they did. Right? They, and now that if they would be asked, they'd object to it vehemently. Second, the other couple doesn't want to copy the first couple because, you know, we are living in a very competitive culture, right? And therefore, every single person has to, be, has to outdo the other person. The 12 princes of Israel were happy to bring identical gifts because jealousy, resentment, and the desire to outdo others were a foreign concept to them. This is a uniquely Western thing, an American thing. They understood that it's not the gift that matters, but the manner in which the gift is offered that matters, right? That's the difference. God himself gave his seal of approval by counting the gifts each separately, teaching us that what is so special about each person is his spiritual essence, his core. The spirit in which he gives is more important than the gift itself, my friends. It doesn't matter what you give. Your wife, your spouse doesn't need a diamond every single time. The nice word, a little flower, the note in the pocket, the little things that we do are much more valuable than the big things that we do. There's so much more value in the small and the big. Now, this is a lesson that we have to remind ourselves to implement uh, in our own lives. Our generation is one that measures a person by the things they possess rather than what he or she is. The story of the tribal princes comes to remind us that each of us are bespoke by God. We are custom made by God and we have unique souls with a unique mission and that it is not having more, but it's about being more that matters. I don't care what you have. I want you to become more. That's what matters. God is measuring your greatness by your desire to become more than what you are. God doesn't look at your possession. He doesn't care about how many cars you have, how many homes you have. He doesn't care about the dollars in your bank but rather he, carry, he cares and he's concerned about the spirit in which you gave that money, the spirit in which you use that car, the spirit in which you use that beautiful house. So instead of focusing on the physical and the material, let us try to develop our inner selves, our inner being. May we be blessed with the ultimate blessing of happiness and health and success and everything that we do. But may we be reminded that the real blessing in this world is when we become individual women. Robin? Yeah. I think you just got cut off. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like I'm so proud. Of, I'm so proud of you. I'm gonna let you say hello to the rabbi. Maybe you'll get through. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I I think Okay, I think we're over. <laughs> yeah, five o'clock, Bubba. Okay, my love. I'll speak you later. Bye. Good afternoon. <laughs> Bye. All the best.